Hello, and welcome to the course. I'm your host today, Stephen, and I'm speaking with Professor Matthew Jesse Jackson, Chair of the Department of Visual Arts. Professor Jackson is a professor of art history, theater, and performance studies, visual arts, and the college, and has published and translated several books, including The Experimental Group, Ilya Kabakov, Moscow Conceptualism, Soviet Avant Garde, for which he won the Robert Motherwell Book Award, as well as the Vucinich Book Prize. Professor Jackson is here today to talk to us about his career path and how he became a University of Chicago professor. Welcome to the course, Professor Jackson. I'm Matthew Jesse Jackson. I teach art history and I'm the chair of the visual arts department. So what I generally do is I work with artists and with people who want to uh, write about art and talk about art. And I deal with curators at some, at various different points or with art writers. It's a public facing job in certain ways, but uh, at the end of the day, what I do is I, I generally write books. So that that's my role at the university, I guess. All right. Well, yeah, we'll get into that. And it's interesting. Um, I mean, we, we've spoken with a lot of professors who have uh, public facing elements to uh, their jobs, but uh, it sounds like yours uh, is, is unique. I look forward to hearing about it. But First, uh, we, we would like to go uh, way back and, and hear a little bit more about your bio. So um, I want you to just take us back to when you were maybe like middle or high school. Um, what did you what did you want to do? What did you think you were going to end up doing? And, and did it bear any resemblance to the, the path that you ended up taking? I had no idea that you could empl be employed doing what I'm doing when I was <laughs> in. I mean, I literally had no idea that you could be employed to talk about art when I was in high school. I don't even think I knew what art was really. I mean, I knew I'd, he I'd, I'd heard of paintings. I suppose I'd seen a few, but I hadn't really been in an American art museum. Not really, certainly not. I'd never been in the Met or anything like that. So art came to me very late because I didn't realize that art simply described a lot of things that don't make sense. I, I didn't know that we had this box that said, well, if you don't exactly know what it is and it doesn't totally make sense, it might be art. <laughs> and now I've I've just kind of realized, oh, every, all over the place, everywhere you go, there are things that to some extent could be viewed as art. And there are things that you'll, and and it's a joke on the one hand, but on the other, it's not. Yeah, it's been it's been frequently said that Vladimir Putin is um is a performance artist. Hmm. It had been said. And you now see that, you know, there's a lot of truth to that. Or that Donald Trump, a lot of what he does has an aesthetic component. Hmm. It's not really ideological or political in a narrow way. It's it's the way he does things. It has a certain artfulness. And uh that's been really helpful for me in defining what I do in life, which is I go around trying to be observant and attentive to the artfulness that I see around me. Okay, that's really interesting. So, uh, could you and and we'll we can get into the details uh, as we talk. But uh, just could you sort of give us an outline of the uh, trajectory that you took? Uh, I mean, I, I guess starting in college and ending uh, at present day. Sure. Where, uh, yeah, you know, what, what institutions have you have you studied at? What degrees have you gotten? And then what if, uh, yeah, what is your your path been? Well, you know, it's funny that uh, I didn't, I only applied to one school for college oh. and it just happened to be the school that my dad went to. So I, I went to the Florida State University in Tallahassee, Florida. Uh, hey, okay. So that's what I did. Then I went to Columbia for a while in academic terminology. I went ABD, all but dissertation in comparative literature. I studied Russian, French, and to some extent, German literature. And then I got an art history PhD from Berkeley. And um, so I then was hired to be an art historian. And I first taught at the California College of the Arts, which is in San Francisco and Oakland. And I really liked teaching at an art school. I liked being around artists. And that led to me being hired at the University of Chicago to teach in the art department. And that's where I've been ever since. So 
fairly straightforward academic uh, situation where I, when I went to, as an undergraduate, I, well, this is funny, actually, as an undergraduate, I never took an art history class, nor an art class. Hmm. So uh, what I've ended up doing professionally, I did not even study in college. Yeah. And uh, so you you said that you uh, did all but your dissertation in comparative literature. I'm curious, uh, you know, what led you to uh, pit it from that and, and then eventually do a, a different uh, dissertation? Yeah, that's a that's actually a good question, and and I'm noticing already in this interview that it, this the danger here is that you're you're telling too much truth. <laughs> uh, so there's the truth of the matter is I figured out in comparative literature you had to know German incredibly well, Russian incredibly well, French incredibly well to really do the job, and it's a lot easier just to look at sculptures and paintings that are made by people around the world and to talk about them. Right. It doesn't require uh, knowing gerunds in in Russian. So uh, I thought uh, art is a much more universal language in that respect. It's just used to be very blunt about it. It's 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 something it would take a lifetime to become familiar with uh, Persian literature, whereas in a day or two, you could become fairly conversant, at least superficially, with the art of uh, Persia. Mm -hmm. So th these are the kinds of uh, distinctions that I, I started to uh, grapple with, is that uh, verbal expression is obviously crucial for humans, but they do many things that are nonverbal that carry meaning. And those meanings are a lot harder to figure out. Uh, and I find that paradoxical, complex, interesting. Yeah. So, you know, uh, yeah, uh, talking about your uh, dissertation, you know, can you just sort of uh, explain to us, you know, what, what are some of the, the biggest, I guess, difficulties that you encountered and um, what or whom helped you uh, overcome them? Yeah, that's a, another good question is when you're studying, I think, as an undergrad or a grad student. Uh, and frankly, you never stop being a student. The people who think that they stop being a student probably aren't the greatest scholars. You, you never stop learning how to do your job. Uh, and you're never an expert. You're always an amateur, from my point of view. Mm -hmm. And I think I've always admired those people who grasp the fact that knowledge is a process and the key is to be deeply engaged in that process. It doesn't matter where it leads. And it doesn't matter whether you're good at it or bad at it. It just means that you're engaged in it fully. And you see what happens. Uh, I, I don't really care much about quality. Quality is a, a word I don't really ever employ. I don't, I'm never that interested in whether something's good or bad because it's very much dependent upon your point of view. It's one thing that's become obvious to me is that uh, differing people around the world who come from, with different experiences are going to have vastly different judgments about good and bad. Mm -hmm. I find it fascinating that there are different points of view. That I love. Uh, good and bad's less interesting. So I think the people I tended to uh, gravitate toward were those who I thought have been willing to embrace the totality of experience. The person that uh, the I studied with uh, at Columbia uh, was Robert McGuire. He's a Russian literature specialist. He's not with us any longer. Uh, he was a wonderful person who uh, was just interested in everything. And anytime you spoke with him, he was engaged in the conversation as soon as you began. And I just had a lot of uh, good times with him. And then similarly, when I was at Berkeley, uh, my advisors there were Ann Wagner and T.J. Clark, uh, great art historians who um, now live in the UK. And they were always encouraging about uh, going further with your concerns and your interests. I think that's the issue for me, is that I don't think refinement is really at the core of knowledge. It's a necessary skill. You, you have to refine what you know. But the key really is to go for breadth, 
to try to learn as much as you possibly can about as many things as you possibly can. And then you pull it back and, and try to make some judgments, try to make some uh, structural narrative choices. But the key is don't lock yourself in and say, this is what I do. This is what I study. I really, that's why art's a great thing. Anything could be art, literally. So. <laughs> Okay, yeah, that's yeah. that's interesting to hear. Are you? I mean, you know, as, as you were finishing uh, your PhD, it was yeah. it a a foregone conclusion for you that you would be a professor? Were there other routes that you were considering taking? Uh, you know, how did you end up uh, going down this path? I'll be brutally honest. I expected to probably teach high school, and I was okay with that. <laughs> right. um, you know, I yeah. I, th I even had a high school in mind in San Francisco that I teach at. So I was kind of thinking, well, you know, I'll, I'll try to teach uh, high school and live a pleasant life. And, uh, you know, to me, the, the key question, if I were giving life advice to someone, is find the thing that you want to do when you wake up in the morning. I wanted to wake up in the morning and think about art and talk about art with people. I, I enjoy doing it. It makes me happy. So any way I could be employed to do that would be a legitimate job for me. It just so happened that I ended up teaching at the college level and then eventually at a research university. But I, I'm certain I could have been entirely happy teaching elementary school if I were an elementary art teacher. You know, it, I would I just love being around art. All right. Well, uh, since since you are where you are, <laughs> can you tell sure. us a, a little bit about, uh, you know, what uh, your research uh, has been, what, what kind of questions you're you know curious about and, and looking into at the moment? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, the area that uh, of the world that I've studied in great depth, uh, one could say, is Russian and Soviet material, which is, as current events would suggest, uh, can be a, a difficult area of the world to study. It uh, presents its own unique problems. I spent the better part of a decade of my life uh, interviewing Soviet dissident artists, artists who were not allowed to practice their art in public because there were no galleries, no museums, no museums at least that would accept their art. So they had to make their art in basements and attics and in the back of an apartment. And I spent a long time trying to understand what this life was like, what got them up in the morning to make art when you could only show it to, at the very most, 30 of your friends. Uh, and you couldn't be paid for it, really. There was no market for the art. So it brought up all sorts of interesting questions, and that, that was my first book that I really worked on. And since then, I have moved on to other topics that probably engage a bit more with the broader questions of what is art, how does art function in a contemporary society, um, and that's those are the sorts of questions I'm working on right now. Could you tell me a little bit more about uh, the interviews that you mentioned, though? I mean, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm guessing that the majority of art historians uh, are do not have the ability to speak to the people who who made the art that they're studying, or, or many don't. I mean, yeah, just I, I guess actually, if, if you could kind of explain that whole process, because um, I don't know how someone identifies and, and gets in contact with somebody like that, or what kind of questions you ask once you have. You know, now that you mention it, and I don't know that I've had this conversation with anyone ever, potentially, is that I began the process in the 2000s, and we were still at that point faxing information back and forth sometimes. <laughs> uh, I would cold call people in Moscow. I would get a phone number from one friend, and I'd simply cold call someone and say, uh, and of course, I had to say it in Russian and my Russian's OK, but it's they could tell this is not a native speaker. And uh, you would just call people up and say, I heard from uh, Vladimir Vladimirovich that uh, you worked with him and you had a painterly practice and that I would pursue the conversation. Mm. I went to Moscow. I went to St. Petersburg. I spoke with people in Western Europe. Most of the people I spoke with probably had immigrated, probably half and half. And those conversations were so incredibly meaningful. I probably have never entirely processed it 
probably a third of those artists are no longer alive. And obviously, as time moves on, uh, that whole generation will disappear. And I had the privilege of being able to speak to uh, just this incredibly fascinating range of people who persevered in the face of just challenges that most of us couldn't even imagine. I mean, mm. uh, we, it it's really true. The KGB are, are knocking on the door and saying, you know, open up, uh, we're here to search. Uh, hard to imagine that sort of situation. I tried to. Um, one thing that I learned, simple point that I'd make, no matter what you're doing, uh, talking to the people who actually did it is a really useful experience because you'll learn so much. I'm not saying that you can't read someone's book, uh, an author's work, and have incredibly interesting thoughts about it without talking to the author, but you will learn certain information from talking to the author that you simply will never uh, derive unless you talk with them. Certain things become obvious within a few minutes that you just never would have gotten to. <laughs> uh, okay, that, that's interesting. I, do you have an example in mind, or can you think of one of a time when sure. you think, oh, I'm glad I was able to speak with you? Sure. I mean, there's there's a certain person who was uh, in, in Moscow, uh, Andrei Monistirsky. He's a conceptual artist. He's not that well-known in the West, uh, historically speaking. I knew within about a minute of speaking to this guy that he would be qualified as a genius. Uh, he was just, I could tell that his conceptual grasp of art, how it functions, what it does, how it did it in the Soviet era was just so on point in so many different ways. And I don't know that I would have fully grasped that by reading his writings, which might simply seem esoteric or enigmatic at times. So it helped me to put everything together very rapidly. Cool. Uh, yeah. All right. I like that. Um, well, okay. So uh, we, we've been asking everyone, uh, what are some fun and some not so fun aspects of your job? Uh, I don't know if you, if you feel that you've already covered the fun bit, but I'll, I'll put that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, the yeah, there's a lot of fun in my job. I can't complain. I, I, I frequently say, if you told me 25 years ago that I get to do what I do, I would have said, wow, fantastic. I, I'm grateful for that. The, the unpleasant things, I don't like judging things and I don't like judging people. And it's one of those things about art that technically, whenever you decide to talk about one piece of art, you're choosing not to talk about other pieces. That's a judgment, whether it's explicit uh, or not. And that's probably the part of my job that I don't like as much is that you you can't attend to everything. So you end up having to emphasize certain work over other work. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's that's that, that's the closest I get to something that's unpleasant, I'd say. That's interesting. Yeah. And so yeah. I wonder, like, you know, how do you decide what to focus on in, in, that, in that instance? And I, I like what you said about, you know, not trying to determine everything's quality, but what, yeah, uh, yeah well, how, do you, how do you pick your subjects in that case? It's, it's a great question. I, I think the things that are the most difficult for me are the ones that are the most interesting. Mm -hmm. So it's the, it's the artwork that challenges me. So one of the paradoxes, of course, is the work of art that I'm not even sure if it's art and I'm not sure at all whether it's, quote, good, <laughs> is usually the most important for me. Whereas the work of art that I can very rapidly say, oh, that's that's fairly good. Uh, that's just not as interesting because it doesn't present the kinds of differences from your uh, expectations that really will continue to propel your mind in the directions that promote uh, greater thought, at least for me. What's, uh, what, what are some examples of, uh, of you know, pieces or works that have uh, challenged you or that maybe uh, didn't immediately, uh, that weren't immediately obvious that they were art? Yeah, uh, quite a few. Uh, historically speaking, it's the, the cliches, the ones that anyone would point to. The conceptual art in the 1960s and 70s, when people would start to simply say something was their art, mm. uh, they didn't make it. They simply denominated it. This is the kind of art. It's a prototypical examples 
of people saying, oh, come on, that's not art. <laughs> and I get it. I never I never question if someone says, well, that's nonsense. That's that's not art. I don't disagree from their point of view. It's nonsense and it's not art. That's fine with me. I'm not going to say you're wrong. For me, the big question with art is it's art for me. It doesn't have to be art for you. That's hmm. totally OK. It works for me. And the part about it working for you is that is a sincere judgment. It's not a judgment. I'm not saying this works for me and this proves that I'm some really intelligent person who appreciates really complex art. No, for whatever reasons, it just works for me. Uh, and I'm sure it might work for someone else. I would say the most fascinating pieces for me are the ones that I didn't know they were art until later. Uh, for example, I was one time in Los Angeles at the Getty... Uh, center, uh, the Getty Museum. And I was at an, uh, an academic conference. And it was a normal academic conference where people get up and give papers. And someone got up and started lip syncing their paper. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that was my reaction. Like, what? <laughs> and then I realized it was a totally legit paper, but it was a work of art. Hmm. And that totally worked for me because I wasn't thinking art was going to happen. I wasn't expecting it. It hit me and I knew something strange was going on. And after the fact, it gave me this warm and fuzzy feeling of, wow, that was really great. I loved it. <laughs> That's interesting. I, I, how long did it take? I'm, this is just my own journey. Yeah. How long did it take you to realize what was happening there? <sighs> Uh, I don't know that while it was happening, I knew it was distinctly different. And it was even better than that. They they had a lip sync Q&A, too. They had a person in the <laughs> audience get up and lip sync the question, which when you think about having the recordings already done, that's kind of tricky to pull that off. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So after it was done, I was. What what was that? <laughs> and I don't think they said it was art, they, they, which is really smart. They said, oh, it's just what we do. And uh, yeah, so I but then again, on the other side of things, I think a lot many things that are uh, historically we don't understand as art today will eventually be understood as art. For example, Mandela and Martin Luther King, I feel almost certain in 300, 400 years, we'll see them as artists. They'll still be crucial political figures as well, but we'll see that there was so much artfulness in the ways that they were able to uh make uh, public expressions of empathy uh, vital and transformative. Hmm. Yeah, and it's not taking anything away from the political impact to say that they, it was artistically done and, and that so lot much of what they did is a performance. Am I hearing you right? That is exactly where I would be going with that. And then if you put it into the history of art, it's easy to see that most of the works of art in the art museums today, uh, the, as you go back in time, they weren't intended as art. They were utilitarian objects that now seem to be art. And that's kind of how I think many of these activities will eventually be understood in that way. Hmm. I guess that's true. I mean, Renaissance portraits had a, a sort of practical purpose at the time. They were yeah, exactly. made to hang in museums. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Well, uh, we may have already touched on this, but um, one question uh, that we've been asking is, you know, are there things that you uh, haven't gotten to yet that you hope to in your career or areas uh, that you're still eager to explore? And uh, and if so, what are some of those? Yeah, I, I've probably spent more time thinking about the ways that you present information to be banal and blunt about it. Uh, that is, we have a very standardized way in academia of presenting our information. It generally consists of writing something on a computer, you type in ideas that you have come up with, then you send those ideas off to an editorial board. The editorial board will make some suggestions and you respond and then it gets published in a perfect world. Mm. Or you go to a room and you stand in front of the room and you have a PowerPoint and you explain your thoughts about the images that you show. Those are perfectly legitimate ways to present information. My hunch is that in the 21st century, those forms of information production are going to look more and more archaic. And we're going to understand that uh, information has been presented throughout time in much more interesting ways. 
And this was just a product of sort of the confluence of technology and certain folk ways of I might say a certain kind of experience of European males that naturalized these as the appropriate ways to present things. Uh, that's that's where I think my work is going is to be really I'm very curious about you know to be to give you the most extreme versions of this. Uh, what would it mean to dance your dissertation? <laughs> you know what would it mean to uh, create a a film in your for your course on uh french poetry what would would we go about managing a much more expansive understanding of of how we produce uh knowledge well wow, all right well uh okay uh what advice would you have for people who uh were looking to enter your field uh, my one word advice was probably don't go into my field or <laughs> something like that um uh, if if you do, my first piece of advice is uh, don't do anything that you don't absolutely love. But if you absolutely love it, you'll be stunned by how readily one will be able to do it for one's life uh, as one's life's work. Uh, so the most important thing is to evaluate what you genuinely love. All right. Well, I think that leads very nicely to our uh, last question, which is, uh, what do you find most gratifying about what you do? I'll give you a depressing answer, <laughs> which <laughs> is, yeah, the depressing answer is I always have this vision of, uh, you know, when it's all over and you look back and you say, was that a life well spent? I, I'm, I feel as if... Um, I'm spending my life doing something that seems uh, important to me, and I don't think it's hurting anyone. So <laughs> hopefully that'll be a life well spent. Thank you again, Professor Jackson, for your time today. And to course takers, if you enjoyed listening to today's interview, please check out the other ones. Leave us a comment, subscribe, follow, and share this episode with your friends and family. You can find out more about the University of Chicago through uchicago.edu or the university's campus in Hong Kong through uchicago.hk. Stay tuned for more. See you around.